So, welcome to the Butterfly Effect Studio. I'm your host, Christian Remenick. As you know, based on the KR3, small changes can have a big impact. The goal of the session is to uncover how leaders and change makers develop their purpose, their competences, and the community around them to achieve great positive impact. Every of the episode is packed full of ideas you can apply to your own life. In this conversation, I speak to Noor, co-founder of Invested. Noor was chief people officer at N26, VP people at SoundCloud, where she has shown how to scale and evolve organizations in a sustainable way during times of extreme growth and constant change. Noor is also globally recognized for her track record in building high-performance teams. Great to have you in the studio, Noor. Yeah, thanks, Christian, for the invitation. Really great to be here. Noor, um, that's such an amazing track record. Tell us a little bit more about your life and what has actually motivated you in your career. I think a very big motivation was more um, uh, definitely at the beginning a more selfish one. I'm super curious, right? So I want to have constantly mm -hmm. new things. Um And you're very like like how it goes in life. When you look back, it all has more themes than than how you experience it in the moment. But um, I've traveled a lot abroad. I always went for international opportunities, and also in jobs, I was bored very easily. So I was always looking for new projects and opportunities to take on. Now, in hindsight, when you look at my resume, it feels like a very steady path. But actually, when I took all the decisions in life, it was really in the moment decision of like, oh, that mm -hmm. excites me. Mm -hmm. And the themes that I recognize is one, learning something new, being curious and just stepping in. Um, and and I think I have something, that, uh, thanks to my parents, that I like to step into new environments and I'm not afraid. That helps. Um, and then the second thing is, I also have a healthy level of insecurity. Like we very often learn that you shouldn't be insecure, but actually it's really good to also be insecure because it's a driver to do your best or figuring out how you can do something the best. It also sometimes can help to put you in a learning mode if you treat your insecurity in the right way. And then the last piece is really connecting myself with the right people. So I really like, learning from other people. Everyone has a different oh, learning yeah. style, but that helps because mm -hmm. then when you want to learn from other people, you will also see that people are actually very generous human beings. We sometimes forget that when we watch the news, but in general, in life, people are very generous. And when you show that you want to learn from them or want to surround yourself with them, they will also help giving you all those elements. And I think throughout my career, that has been the driver of why I did what I did um, and later in life, different purposes are being added to that. Yeah. How, how has purpose maybe shaped over your life? Did you have a purpose when you started maybe um, after university? What was driving you? I mean, clearly curiosity, I agree. Uh, I love also learning and it, it's, it's an amazing path. If you have actually, if you're willing to take on, Challenges, but what was driving you? Did you ever have a purpose which you defined explicitly? I think with me, like I, I now see in next generations that the the purpose and the, the definition of how they want to have impact, there's much more awareness of that earlier in life. Like I'm a little bit older, and with me, it came also at a later stage. So I think yeah. just after university, yeah. were very selfish motivations, to be honest. I worked for IBM and IBM wanted to relocate me to New York. I thought New York was cool, right? Like that was literally, <laughs> my purpose was check off New York. But later, um, you are experienced that, hey, there are people in the world. I've been very lucky. I had access to great education system, to great people. Um, mm -hmm. uh, my parents had, had a, good, a good background. And then actually by going by IBM, uh, IBM to New York, I landed in a, a traineeship with people from all around the world and coming from very different backgrounds um, mm -hmm. who had to fight way harder. Some people were refugees from uh, war zones. A lot of it were women and talking about the position of women in different sides of the world um, mm -hmm. uh, and how they got that opportunity by actually going to the U.S. And I think that really changed something really big with me that I realized like, okay, I intrinsically with everything that I do, 
um, uh, also want to have a, you were talking at the beginning at your intro, let, like small things can have a big impact. I cannot change the world on my own, but at least with everything that I do, I can have a positive impact on someone. And then specifically people who benefit from that. So the 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 easier position that I have, I want to use to making sure that others also have that access. And that translated constantly differently. So from then on, when I traveled, I always did something in the local community. That's first how it started. And then later in my HR roles, I was very focused on hiring also on the represented people and making sure that there were equal opportunities for, for uh, men and women in the workplace. And in my current uh, job, so with Invested, we advise companies, but we also invest in companies. We only invest in underrepresented founders. So that means people want to start their business but have less access to the network and to capital. And we don't have massive capital, but we can at least give a little bit of a Kickstarter. And we have the network to set people up for success. So how it operationalizes has changed over time. Amazing. Um, no, so, but you mentioned also like going to New York, there's a big, then then stepping into like really tough roles. Um, you face challenges and you face uncertainty as well. Um, how did you overcome those challenges? Um, I mean, there are setbacks like in every of those journeys, I most likely. Yeah. So, uh, was there um, was what was driving you that you overcome those challenges? What was the inner motivation for you? I think what happens a lot in life is also if you have challenges. I think you're you're also wired in a certain way that mm -hmm. that you can handle it. Like you can you can work on emotional resilience. Um, mm -hmm. um, You can train that for yourself and you can find your own coping mechanisms, but there's also a foundation that you have. I think what is helpful, at least has been very helpful for me, is to always take a very analytical approach when something happens. So there are two things to it, right? Like there are very overwhelming times in life, in work or in private life. And it feels like you're in that wave and that wave is taking you and you can't you don't know anymore like what's the bottom of the sea and how do i get out of it yeah. and what is good is a be kind to yourself right so start beating yourself up that you got caught in that wave doesn't really help to the situation but a lot of people do that um b when you recognize it try to break down the different elements of the wave Someone once told me everyone can eat an elephant, just not in one serving. So <laughs> I think that that's a great expression, like break it down mm -hmm. to smaller pieces and then it becomes more actionable. And the third thing is try to put yourself on shore. So try to put the wave in the context of a bigger story. So for example, when you are in a company and it's a very overwhelming phase, Take a step back for yourself, even just literally draw up a timeline on that activity or the journey that you went on, because then you're forcing yourself to put this glitch in time in a bigger storyline. And it will give you a different perspective that makes at least helps with like reducing the overwhelmingness uh, of the well, race that you're in. That's beautiful, inspirational. Um, I love that. Just, just trying to recap this for the audience. Um, so you mentioned emotional resilience, um, just that you say, hey, accepting the reality. I think you mentioned also to be kind to yourself. Um, just a team member of us said lately that um, I asked him about his role model. And he said his father is his role model because he taught him self-love. And that this is something, be kind to yourself, okay. what you mentioned, I think yeah. is really so important um, in this in, in the struggles. Um, and the third thing I loved also is this kind of analytical approach to to put things into a bigger context, um, and which is so important, I think, um, to not just jump on, on the hiccups or the, the issues of life, but see, hey, there's maybe a, a, a underlying theme which helps you to continue. Um, that's, that's so beautiful. Um, what are the, and these are, I think, some of the competences which are really relevant um, to be successful. And this reflects also well with the 21st century competence you're talking now about, which um, yeah. 
you, you apply. But maybe a question, how do you learn them? How do you build them up? How do you define them for yourself? I think with a, with a lot of the competences, right? It, it depends a bit on what the competence is. But if we're talking about the different domains of uh, of emotional intelligence, which I think for the future is at the core of everything, yeah. right? And there's a beautiful article, very easy read, by the way, of Harvard Business Review, where they really break down the domains and competences that fall under EQ. I can definitely recommend it to anyone. But the different styles to to uh, learning, but I think the the important part is to realize what works best for you, right? Mm -hmm. Because how to become uh, more self-aware can be different for me or for you, Christian, right? Like some people are um, uh, really like constant 360 feedback. Mm -hmm. I like feedback, but I also know that I have times where my inner critic is way louder and then it, it does it actually doesn't help me to get more feedback right i need at that moment i need encouragement because because i need to slow down the inner critic and in another moment i need that so what is important is for yourself to analyze when were you in your strength you have those moments or days where you you feel it yourself right like i'm now operating in the best way ever this is when you have the highest self resilience right you're like this is a good day and thinking around what what worked really well did you get good feedback were you inspired by someone did you read something that gave you the tools to go through something and really use yourself a little bit as a project to say hey what what are the mechanisms that work very well for me and over time what I found out is like, okay, I need to take a very almost like an anthropologist analytical view on myself that when I feel overwhelmed, I need to do what's counterintuitive to how I normally act. Mm -hmm. Right? Because I feel better if I put things in action, but actually I need to reflect. Mm -hmm. And over time, when you realize that for yourself, and you find it out, it's also trial and error. But sometimes just use yourself as a study object and go back to the moments where it went well or didn't go well and try to analyze what happened in that situation. I felt insecure and I went to this networking dinner where I didn't know anyone. And then there was this one person that made me even more insecure. And like, how did I get into this horrible spiral? Right? Like what happened? Yeah. And it will give you some tricks and tips of being able to putting yourself in the best context and that will really help with self-management the self-control and in the end when you have high self-awareness and self-control that will help with um, uh, building up your resilience yeah i love that so um it's really about you started very early on as it seems with self-awareness um and then literally um analyzing yourself looking at how you're perceived how you what does cause what kind of feeling and based on that um the second step is then literally the self-leadership okay what how i took it, how I, what i do with this information actually yeah um but i guess you haven't learned this in school did you learn this from your parents or who has, has helped you to create this kind of self-awareness no uh, um um we're not like we are being told knowledge right and that's um and uh, well i'm preaching to the choir here but uh, uh, i think that that's just not the future yeah um and even though everyone is wired in the different way understanding how you are wired and how you can optimize um uh, your your own full system so to say uh, and use it to the best effect in order to have impact that is something that you can already even teach children very early on, right? We now try to push children uh, all through the same machine. But it would be really interesting if our focus would be more for the child to understand themselves as a machine at the right age, by the way. Like they also have just a free forming phase. You don't, a child that's five doesn't need to be self aware. Let them just be themselves, please. <laughs> 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 so true, beautiful. Um, so, uh, no, talking about what you're driven in inner in drive, um, but coming to the competence more, um, 
you took on quite challenging roles. What have been the the most besides this emotional intelligent intelligence, which was obviously a very important part actually to manage those challenges? What have been other competence which helped you the most in your life actually? Um, I think so. For me, like the whole EQ thing is just foundational, right? You can put it in the yeah. middle of a circle or the, the mm -hmm. layer uh, below, mm -hmm. but the very important building blocks on top of it, right? So I think more than ever, the importance of being a problem solver, right? Like mm -hmm. making sure that you're very focused. It's, it's being a problem solver, but with that, a problem is always out, is an output drive. Right. What is the impact of my actions? Right. And uh, very often society is still very focused on input versus output. And I think um, uh, if you can change that and, and be much more focused on the solution rather than the problem and, and the, the impact that behaviors have will um, uh, really get you further in life. That's one piece. And two other things that help is and some of it I really needed to learn. But be very analytical. That doesn't mean always analytical in the sense of like numeric analytics, but it's also about being analytical in how you communicate, breaking down a problem, breaking down the path that you're going on and breaking down the solution, because it will help you with the third very important pillar, which is communications. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think we're moving from an era where people were very interesting when they talk very complex. And I think we've now adopted in life that actually it's most complex to, to communicate simple. Um, and that should also be re ranked highest on the hierarchy. Right. Because, um, uh, and when you're able to break things down and analyze what did you do? What happened? What are we going to do? And how are we going to tackle it? will help you to also be very good and communicated in a simple way that gets others on board, understanding the journey. And then so, it touches on a lot of different things because it will help you influence people, getting people on board, will help with collaborations. But like the core skill of being analytical about situation and simplified communications has definitely helped me. Um. Thank you. Um, so looking at those, um, skills you have built up, are there, do you have your, what are the habits you have built up to manage actually, um, your success constantly? Because as we know, also, it's not that it, there is something like a one time action, which is changing everything tomorrow. Um, but yeah. do you have established some certain habits which help you, um, every day, every week, every month, actually, which are more recurring patterns for you? Well, so maybe uh, it helps to some, give some very practical tips um, mm -hmm. uh, very silly ones actually, but they helped me a lot is for example, when I start a project and in the end, solving a problem always can have a project type of approach. Yeah. I started with writing the, if I would write a blog post afterwards about what we did, I start with writing the blog post. And I never published the blog post, but <laughs> the, the um, good thing about it is that you st you have to break it down because if you want to explain it to a reader, you need it to break it down in very clear chapters. It cannot be too long. So you need to become more and more concise. You're really focused on the output and the impact because you're already thinking if this succeeds, if I solve this problem, what is the impact this has? And Then working backwards worked really well for me to make it much more concise and structured. Mm -hmm. So this is a very, maybe a bit of a silly trick, but it helped. That's an amazing trick. Uh, wasn't it Jeff Bezos or somebody who said also first start with a press release you want to issue and then you think backwards? Um, I love that. I think it, it gets a clear, more clarity on the vision. Um, and um, You mentioned you never publish it. Why not? <laughs> no, yeah, that is actually the, the, the interesting thing is because I always told my team also to do it. And then I said, like, and at the end, you just need to update the um, the blog post and publish it because, like, your own um, your own peers will love to read it as well, right? So it's it's also great a great opportunity to post it and people will then also give you uh, feedback on the process mm -hmm. so it's an, an automatic learning uh, system mm -hmm. but 
I'm afraid that this is one of those things where, where you preach, but you don't act yourself. So I should listen to my own advice a little bit better. <laughs> no, but I love the idea. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, if you, if you, because I you mentioned just team members, um, now I think based on the experience as we grow older, also our level of ex expectations towards others maybe raises with that. Yeah. And we know better what we are looking in others. Um, so if you're hiring now team members, are they, what are the, the core value skills you are hiring for? What is the most important things you're looking into any new team member members actually? Um, it's a little bit in the order of things that we currently, we, that we just discussed, right? So one thing that I would find very important is self-reflection. So someone who comes into the interview and just tries to convince me by saying louder and with more conviction that they are the best is not necessarily convincing for me. What would be interesting for me is to understand, do you understand how you are wired mm -hmm. and in which context you are most successful? So just to break a myth, there is no such things, things as high performers in general. Right? People are high performing because there is a great match in how they operate and the context that they operate in. So a person that could be a high performer in Amazon might not be a high performer in Netflix, right? Because it are completely different organizational systems. And I think what is important is in an interviewing process, when I'm the employer, the thing that I know best is our context. So the role that I have in our matchmaking game is to explain to you the reality of the context. Not only the beauty, I shouldn't lie. It's like, it's about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? And the role that you have as a candidate is to be brutally honest about how you are wired and the context that you need to be successful in. And only then, when we put all these cards on the table, we can openly explore whether that combination is most successful for both, because we both don't benefit if it isn't. And of course we learn over time, right? Companies hire people that they are convinced are successful and are not successful. So there's a lot of, there should also be self-reflection in the organization, right? Like, hey, why didn't that work, right? And that doesn't mean that you always need to change your organization. But it means that you need to be more explicit for people coming in, explaining the reality of your organization. Mm -hmm. And um, for the candidate, the same. When it's, when it's not working out, assess what didn't I pick up in the interviewing process or where did I say, hey, no, I'm a complete self-starter. I don't need any guidance. If you walk out and you felt alone, maybe next time you need to say a bit more realistically, I want to have autonomy. But I do need more explicit guardrails in which I, what my playground is. And then within that playground, I want freedom. Are you able to give that to me? Right? So it's also a constant ongoing journey to learn what do you really need from an environment, from management, the way they take decisions, the they, way they approach problems, the freedom that they give, the guidance of the freedom that they give you. To unpack that and be very critical if that other environment, even if it's a very cool logo, like be very critical if that is the organization for you to succeed. Wow. That was not a lot, um, actually, on the great hiring advice, but literally also getting a job advice, I think, um, because I, I think you put it beautifully phrased it, but then now we're talking about self-reflection. It requires self-reflection on the employer side and on the, on the candidate yeah. side. You know, both need to have this kind of awareness. Um, so maybe two questions in that regard. How 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 do you how do you know if somebody is self-aware actually and has to that a true a good 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 understanding of that? Um, and th then the second thing is um, how do you Im improve your self-awareness if you are if you are not, yeah if you're not there? So how do you know and how do you improve from your perspective? Well, I think that those two are linked, right? So it's not about when I'm interviewing people, I'm not looking for someone who all who figured everything out already. Yeah. Way too intimidating if you find someone who figured out life yet and you didn't. Um, but it is good. There is a difference if I have a conversation with a candidate about um, 
okay, in our organization, you need to take probably 15 decisions in a week mm -hmm. and tackling five or six problems. What we have noticed so far is that if you have really good project management skill and can silo the problems a little bit in your approaches, it will make you more successful in our organization. And you can say, I don't know if I can do that. I haven't done the sequence of things, but I do know that in projects, I'm really good in focusing end to end on the problem and doing ABC. So it's also about when I'm giving you an, an, uh, a context or, or a challenge, how you are breaking down that challenge and are translating it with experiences that you already have, right? So make it conversational. In here, I'm really strong. I could see how I can implement that. What do you think of it? Let me give you an example of what I went through. Do you think that that fits in your, your context? Um, and that, that it comes back to also weaving, and you don't need to overanalyze yourself, right? Like it's not that every evening you need to sit down for an hour and analyze how you acted that day. Like let's not overdo it. But on certain core skills, right, that you know in what direction you want to go. If you know I need to be very, it will have a lot of project management uh, focus or it will require a lot of my leadership skills leading up to interviews or, or when you are going to, doesn't even need to be an interview, but if you want to take on a, a next chapter, whatever it is in life. Prepare yourself, but while you're doing your groceries or you're biking to town, to think through what were those moments when I was really a leader? When did it go really well? Or what did I really like about that situation? Then you will naturally have those examples. And then, sorry, I know it's not about interviewing um, uh, tips, but I, I, I do want to link one tip to it. Organizations are very often not self-aware, but you can create self-awareness by right, asking the right questions. Right, just saying that like, hey, um, uh, it it doesn't always turn out well. When people leave very early on, what what did they struggle with most? Right, of like the people that are really succeeded, like what are the common denominators in their approach or their way of working or how they act that lands really well in your organization? Yeah, so. Just to recap that, it's not that everybody is perfectly self-aware from the beginning, but it's something you constantly can practice and by practicing it, you can become better. And it's really that at any point of time in your life, the best thing is to to share actually um, your own self-reflection um, you have about yourself and see see if you for your own, um, if you find a fit describing yourself with anything you're actually embarking on. It, it, maybe it's not just true for um, for working, maybe it's true for relationships or for life. For yeah, yeah, absolutely. Studying as well, I think it, it, it's a, such an important um, aspect um, of of our current um, uh, society, and I, I think it's I agree that self reflection is something which can help us all uh, in literally um, any of our um, endeavors. Yeah? Um, But what's thank also you. important, what I want, sorry, one thing that I would like to add to it is. It's important to also realize that I, th I think a lot of people are focusing on what am I not doing well or what can I not do? And I don't find that very interesting. I found it an, mm -hmm. an energy leaking exercise, right? Mm -hmm. Because something that is not naturally your, of course, you need to, to shave off rough edges, right? Like be a, a, be a nice and a decent human being, please. But like if, um, if there are things that you're less good at, and you put a lot of energy in it, you probably will become less bad, right? Like what's yeah. there to gain? So um, also with feedback, very often when people ask feedback in life, they ask what is annoying you or what is not good. Okay, it's not really interesting because probably you already know what it is. It's something that you're really not good at, right? And you're just being poked on a bruise, right? So what would be interesting is to ask people, where did I have most impact? Where would you have hoped that I had more impact? And where are you hoping I would focusing on in the future to, to um, uh, have more impact? It's for much more constructive and much more focused on the future. And then you will also see where 
where you are really contributing and making a difference. And with by answering the question where people had expected more impact, in general, people will tell you when you underused your strengths, rather than overplayed your weaknesses. And I think that that's a more constructive way for self-growth. Okay. Um, so this is a very, very interesting aspect, I think, for many, because I think as a feedback, we really ask for what was good, what was bad, um, very often today. Um, um, and we are not focusing actually so much on where could have a bigger impact. Um, I love that. Thank you. Um, talking about, because we have need to look a little bit at the time, actually. Um, oh, you yeah, mentioned sorry. at the beginning of the interview also about the community and the people you've helped you and the people you surrounded yourself actually to be successful. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can share a little bit more about who has helped you the most on your journey. How have you found them? Um, and what was your relation there? Yeah, so the, there are basically three categories of people that I surround myself with, right? So when people, the first piece is literally knowledge, like if people have knowledge that I don't have. So when we yeah. started Invested, <laughs> I moved into the investment world. I didn't know anything about investing, right? Uh, but yeah. I just, for the second half of my career, wanted to learn something new. So I just contacted everyone that I knew who had done anything with investing, called them and said, hi. I want to go into investing, but I have two problems. One, I don't have money. And two, I don't know how it works. <laughs> so can you, can you help me with either one of those things? And then people are really generous, right? People love talking about their profession and sharing knowledge. And what helps is that it's also a good test whether you really want to go in that direction because you either get really excited and inspired by those stories and you get great uh, suggestions. It's like, it's like a walking MBA over coffees, right? So it's amazing. And, um, uh, or you get not, you do, a friend of mine did the same, also on investing, by the way. And she thought, oh my God, like I will never get excited about those things. So like, that was also a good way to redirect the dream. And the second thing is when people behaviorally have attributes that I highly admire. So, uh, for example, my colleague David Noel at SoundCloud, he is a storyteller in everything that he does. I think that that's like his master superpower. He can take massive information that he doesn't know anything about. There's also a lot he does know something about. <laughs> can take it in and it comes out in a very concise, broken down, analytical way. And... Um, from him, I copied, like, I just watched all the little tool sets that he had, and sometimes also brought them with a beer to get the insight of the, the, the tools and what he uses, to, um, uh, to copy that, because it's just inspiring, right? So they're doing a skill set that I know that there are attributes that I have that could go in that direction, but I also know, well, conciseness is very clear on this podcast. I didn't master that one. Um but it's like that there are elements that I can copy and really get. And then the third category are people who almost counter my critical voice. So who are my cheerleaders? So people never talk about it, but everyone needs cheerleaders to make you fly as well. Right. So it's also good to just surround you with them. So, for example, Anna, my business partner, we are very different. Um, but I think we are each other's biggest fans. And that helps because if you're then in front of a situation that you find challenging or it's making you insecure or your critical self is like making overtime, um, it's good to have that other person that is proud to work with you and constantly like cheering that on. And having that right balance of people giving you new knowledge of bringing new topics to the table so you constantly get new inputs on the content piece. People who have skill sets that you admire, that you can literally watch and copy from, that that really help you in building out that own skill and having a third category of your um, uh, yes. personal promotion team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that bubble is very helpful. Oh, I love that. I become a cheerleader of you, know. <laughs> I am a cheerleader of you. Like, let me tell you that. So. No, this is really inspiring. Um, it's so helpful. So, so no, now that you become my role model, um, who is your role model, actually? 
who are you looking up to and who is like somebody what you mentioned uh, like storytelling but who's really for one for you which you say that's a person who inspired me in my, my life so um um uh... A person who really inspired me because um, is Nelly Smith Cruz. She's a, a Dutch politician, but she was also in the European Committee, and she really fought for startup, skill up, stack, mm -hmm. um, uh, accessibility for people to to add that system. But also in the European Committee, was encouraging for tech innovation to come to Europe. But that also she was the one who was the first one to have big fines for the Googles and the Facebooks when she felt that it was getting too much out of balance with the big guys versus the opportunities for the smaller people. And uh, she's from a generation where she literally had to fight from scratch, fight her way off. And I think she used and she got in positions of power, but I like how she used her positions of power. Mm -hmm to always drive and for innovation, but also for equal access and making sure like it doesn't need to be like full equal, but there should be an equal playing field. Yeah, um, with power comes responsibility. And I also admire yeah. anyone who actually takes on this responsibility um, if, they are, if they're in power and not just talks about it beforehand. No, we need to come to an end, but I need to ask this last yes, question. Is there anything else you want to share to our students, yeah, with your broad knowledge experience and, uh, yeah, um, you have built up? Is there something which you think is really important for every learner? Um, maybe what would you, what would be the recommendation you would give yourself now to, with your knowledge today um, when you would have been, when you have been young and just finished maybe school? Well, I think that the advice that I would give myself is like, be much more conscious and aware early on. But I actually mm -hmm. think that your audience doesn't need that advice because I have much more hope for the few, for the next generations than for my own generation, even though it's an awesome generation. <laughs> um, but I think like the, the fact that they started to join um, your university means that they already stepped up of like, okay, I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to do something different. And, um, so I would, it would feel a bit arrogant to give them an advice, like continue what you're doing. You're an inspiration for us. And the fact that people are on earth longer or working longer is, uh, is not more inspirational than the other way around. Like they are really making the difference. No pressure there. But just <laughs> keep doing what you are doing. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Um... Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for joining here at the Butterfly Effect Studio. Thank you very much um, for sharing your purpose, your, your what you learned, um, and also um, a little bit more about the network you surround yourself. I think this is really helpful for all our students actually on their journey and um, something they can learn from. Cool. Thank you, Christian, for having me. Thank you very much.